The scripture will be from Daniel chapter 2, verses 12 through 23. That's Daniel 2, 12 through 23. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with the wisdom and tact. He said to the king's officer, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained to Daniel, At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for him for time, so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matters to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy for the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might be executed, might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise to the name of wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He is wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deeps and hidden messages. He knows what lies in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Thank you, Connor. It's good to see everybody this morning. You're hearing a little deaf because of all the fireworks going off. And hope you got enough sleep and all of that. It's always good to realize that we have a God who we can pray to and a God that we want to be in charge of our nation. And that God does direct nations and that God does move people and moves countries and moves nations and that he is there to be able to bless, that he is there to be able to do so many things with that. And that's just one of those things that I think is just really amazing. And so July 4th always just kind of brings that out to me that, you know, we believe in God and we believe God is able to do something. This morning I wanted to take you back to another kingdom when God is arranging the world the way he wants the world to be. And I'm not sure we would ever quite recognize it because now his people Israel have divided and then they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing so God says I'll just use somebody else so he raises up Nebuchadnezzar and king of Babylon and says well I'll make him king and sure enough all of Israel falls and then all of Judah falls Jerusalem is captured and some of the very very best people are taken away that's who you would take anyway right I mean why would you take the ugly stupid ones I mean, just leave them there. You want to take all the smart, pretty ones. And so that's what he did. And that's who you have taken with Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. All of those are the smart, pretty ones. And, and they've been taken to be in government, to advise, and to be able to do things. And so that's what you find happening in the passage that we're looking at today, is that God does direct our nation I believe that, I hope that, I trust that. God directs all nations, though. And so sometimes he directs nations in this situation as well. And I want us to look at that and think about this. There is a mystery that goes on in Scripture. And it's described that way. Paul says, I was sent to proclaim the mystery. And when you think about this, there are several things that we don't quite grasp, that we don't quite understand in our world. And so I want you to think about these different things today and, and how all of this fits together. And if you just hang with me by the end, hopefully it will all fit together. And so Nebuchadnezzar has conquered Israel, destroyed Jerusalem, taken captives, and so you have some people who are here. The king has a dream. And so in this dream, it's very disturbing for him because he believes the dream is for something that is real, for something that he's supposed to do. And so in the passage that Connor has read to us, he describes here the reaction of what's supposed to happen to this. The king decides, you know, I need some wise men to help me interpret things, but 
I don't want just any wise men. I want the wisest of wise men. So let's not just say, are you smart? Here's the test of what it takes to be a wise man. I want you to tell me what my dream means. But first, you have to tell me what I dreamed. Well, that's kind of difficult to do, isn't it? Let's see. People are always telling, oh, I had this crazy dream, and, you know, the horse went this way, and it climbed the tree, and all these other things. Of, you know, and, and they were awake all night, and all these different things that were going on in their life. And he says, no, you tell me the crazy part of the dream. And that's more difficult to do, isn't it? Because, I mean, you can kind of guess on the interpretation. If you get it a little bit off, who's to say you're wrong? But he remembers the dream. He knows exactly what he dreamed. He just wants you to tell him now and have a good explanation. Well, nobody can, so he's about to kill them all. That's, you know, pretty sad line of work to be in if you can't tell the future and tell the dream and everything else. So... Then you just all die, and well, then how's he going to find it? But So Daniel sees the threat, hears the order, all wise men are supposed to die, and he's one of those, and he says, well, give us a chance. I'll tell you what the dream means. And he doesn't really know yet. He just says, I'll tell you what the dream means. And then he goes and he prays to God because he believes that that's where he's supposed to be. And that's what it's supposed to be like. The dream looks something like this. That way I don't have to explain all the different parts to it. And it's even got a little code thing on the side. As what Now that would be a crazy dream to try and describe, wouldn't it? I saw this big statue and it's made of different metals and you know then this one stone that comes and it knocks the feet out from under it and uh, who would come up with that kind of a dream? But that's what he, he does. That's his dream, and no one else is able to interpret. Daniel understands that his life is very unique. And so he goes in, he's able to tell what the dream is, because he understands, I'm a captive, I'm a slave, I have some responsibility here in the kingdom, so I'm kind of a slave and ruler at the same time, so you have all the responsibility and none of the privilege. Would you like that kind of a job? I mean, that's where he is because, you know, he's got to know everything, and then, but you don't get anything for it. You're just still a slave. And so here he is. He is God's man in the place where God want him, wants him as a captive, as a person who is unable to have his freedom, but who is expected to do everything that God says. That's his place. And he takes it willingly. He says, that's where I want to be then. He understands he's supposed to repent for the sins of his nation. He's willing to do that. He understands he has some prophecy. He understands God's in control of everything. He says, where else would I want to be other than a captive for God? Because isn't that really what it's all about anyway? And so he goes and he begins to give him the interpretation, or he's thankful for this interpretation that God has given him this wisdom and this might and that he's able to know and that God reveals mysteries to Daniel. And that's what he's really trying to describe, is that God reveals these mystery, and Daniel is there to interpret this mystery for the king. And so Daniel agrees to give him the interpretation. He goes in, describes this kingdom, and all the way in which it's supposed to happen, and that the king of Babylon is the head of, of gold, and then he goes down with the different empires that are going to happen. Okay. Now what? I mean, you have history forward. It's going to happen. It'll all be there. We see it as recorded from a long time ago, but it's history forward now. So what does it do for you to know that? Well, here's what I want you to realize about the whole thing as, as you look at this whole idea of history forward, and then Daniel sees this dream that God has given to Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, 
It isn't that he just, you know, ate too much pizza the night before or something like that and had a crazy dream. God has given him the dream, caused the problem where everyone's about to die and gives the interpretation. So now here's the response that he gives him from this interpretation. If you look at Daniel 2 and verse 46, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. And the king answered and he said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods, Lord of kings, revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. And then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made the, him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained in the king's court. It's exactly the response Daniel wants. What an incredible response. How could you get a king of a completely foreign nation that has no promise of any inheritance whatsoever at all, its only place with God is, you know, I want you to punish my people for a little bit. That's it. They don't have any promises. There's no Messiah coming to Babylon. That's it. And yet... By the interpretation of this dream, by revealing this mystery, he gets the king to say, praise be to God. What an awesome, incredible God you have. He's Lord of kings. He's God of gods. He's above everything else. What an incredible, and he gives Daniel all kinds of recognition. He gives Daniel all kinds of, of honor, and he puts him in the highest place. He can be the highest slave in the land, but he's not going anywhere. He's not going back home. He's not getting his own house. He's not getting to own any property. He's a slave of the king. Well, wouldn't you be angry about that? After all, you've done something great here. No. You're in exactly the place where God wants you to be. You are the interpreter of mysteries that allows people to rejoice and praise God. What an incredible place to be. That you're the one that affects that so that the rest of the world is able to see this incredible place of God. And I want you to realize that today. There is no freedom from him for Daniel. And he accepts it perfectly. But I also want you to realize we are in the place of being an interpreter. Have you ever seen people who talk with their hands? Where's Jaden? I mean, they go like this. What did I say? What did I say? Come on, no interpreters here? I'm not saying anything because I don't know how to say it. I need Kelsey or Jaden or some of those guys that really understand sign language in the first place because there's, there are mysteries that God has for this world that he wants you to reveal. Some of it is just nonsense. The part that I do. So we can insist on our, on, on our own way. And say, no, I want to be the one that makes the message. I want to be the one that has the say. I want to be the one that sets it all up. And we can be the smartest idiot in the land, I guess. Because we don't have a clue. There's no interpretation for that. Or we can want, be the one that brings glory to God. We can be the one that interprets mysteries for our world, for our time. What an incredible place that is. We are interpreters for God. And I think we see that a lot of times. We hear stories and we watch people and they don't really know how to relate. Did you see the Noah movie? If you didn't know anything about the Bible and you went and saw the Noah movie, would you know anything about Noah? Not a thing. 
other than there was a guy named Noah, and that's about it. Because none of the rest of that. So if Hollywood is the one directing our Bible knowledge, do you think they need some interpretation? I think our world needs some interpretation. That's going to be a right interpretation. It's not just a matter of somebody making a movie and saying, well, this is what it should be like. And what I see happening a lot today is people fight for what they want in their life. Their own way, their own rights, their own place. They'll never get their dream. But they think they can get it. They can't understand why they can't be happy. Why doesn't somebody give them happiness? They need an interpretation. Because that isn't the way you go about it. And they can't make sense of life. We see in Acts 8 with the Ethiopian as he's riding along, he's reading the Bible, he's going, I just don't get this. I don't understand this. And if they ever did turn to the Bible, they'd be in the same condition and going, you know, what? I, I know there's supposed to be some answers in here somewhere, but I don't get it. They need an interpreter. They need you. Because that is what we do for our time, for our culture, in our world, is to bring about the glory of God. To bring about people who are able to do that. So maybe we need you to be the, the one that signs for somebody else. The teachings of Jesus that we have, who's the master teacher. People still don't get that. Did you realize that? How long we've had teachings from a king of peace, and we find no peace in our world. We find people who argue and fight and do all kinds of things in order to get their way and what they want and the way that they want it and trying to make their life happy and they're not happy. Because nobody's t telling me what I want to have. I want to have honor. I want to have all that glory. I want to have what Daniel had. I want to be the first in the land. And they fight for it. And it doesn't make you first in the land. That isn't the way you go about it. And so I think part of what happens for us is we keep trying to interpret and is nothing but people aren't getting it. They don't really understand. So how would we interpret the dream of God for a world like ours? It's understanding a reality puzzle. We need to help people interpret life. The life that God can give them the dream that God can give them. And so the gospel is a mystery because people obviously don't get it today. What produces a disciple? Jesus came and he called disciples. What produces a disciple? Well, that's kind of a mystery to us too, isn't it? How do you get someone who really believes enough to give up his life for that? How do we bring someone to repentance and baptism? How do we make all of those things happen? We know Jesus was crucified in order to redeem us and redeem our place and our life and so that he died for us. But how do we get a world to see that? Because it's been here for a long time. It's even written in the book. It's even been translated into countless languages and into more modern languages and into paraphrase languages and it doesn't matter how many times we retranslate that thing or or make the language better or make it different we still have a world full of wrath and a world full of confusion and a world full of people who need an interpretation for what God wants because they don't get it they don't understand it at all what makes a disciple follow? Why would you follow? I think two things. I follow what I respect. I follow what I desire. Right? Isn't that what happens most of the time? Maybe what's interesting. Maybe what's intriguing. Maybe what's bigger than me. I've got this curiosity that's kind of a problem as well. It just says, hmm, I wonder what that's like. I wonder what... It's actually all of the Gospels. That's actually what it is. When we start talking about a mystery of daily life and how can we teach people to interpret this daily life so that they come out at the end of the day and say, praise God. 
Is it because wonderful things have happened to them? Chances are not. And so we end up wanting to be lucky rather than blessed. If we could just get lucky, if we could win the lottery, we'd be happy. That would be great. You know how much depression goes with winning the lottery? You got way too many cousins to win the lottery. You know what's going to happen. They're all going to come and they're all going to want to stay and they're all going to... But how do we look at this gospel, this message that we have from God to interpret? I'm just going to take one passage today. If you turn with me to Luke chapter 5 and I want you to just look at this and let's see what it is that people might read or as Jesus looks at it and the way he tries to say, here's what God's trying to say to you. And so if we just take this passage in Luke 5, 17. He says, on one of those days when he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles in the midst before Jesus. And when, and when he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And so as you look at the passage and he's trying to say, it's important to realize Jesus is confronted with a situation. These guys have been confronted with a situation. Pick up again with me in verse, well, 21. The scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's their question. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, and he picked up what he had been lying on, and he went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God, and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. I like this story because it teaches me a lot. You've got four guys who are great friends. I mean, they're the best friends, and they know this guy who's paralyzed. He's completely paralyzed. How long has he been paralyzed? I don't know. Did they know him before he was paralyzed? It is a sudden thing that came on. We don't have the medical description. Uh, we just know that he's paralyzed, and they know he has to come to Jesus, and so they are bringing him to Jesus. Jesus sees their faith, plural. Not the man on the cot, not the people standing around. I think he sees their faith, the people that he is watching let him down through the roof. They've had to take the roof off above. They're trying to get him to Jesus, some way to get him to Jesus. If they can just get him in front of Jesus, their part, their way. Because they understand they don't have any power to change this situation. They can only bring him to Jesus. And they had enough faith to cause God to respond. I want you to realize that's what happens with us. Not that we know how to fix it. But when we have enough faith, God sees that and God responds to that. The man they're letting down has a couple of problems as well. One is sin and the other is paralysis. Both are problems, but one of them is obvious and one of them is not. It's always difficult. You may have come today with lots of sin, and there's probably nobody pointed at you and said, Ah, oh, look at all the sin that guy's got. You know, oh, they did? Sorry. 
Now, hopefully that didn't happen as you came in and somebody just pointed at you. Now, they might notice if you sprained your ankle or something like that, but no, they're not going to notice all the sin that you have. And so this guy has these two issues. Jesus chooses to forgive the sin. If he's going to do a miracle for the man, if he's going to do something, they've brought him to Jesus, the first and most important, obviously, is to forgive the sin. But that's not always what we see as the major problem. He can't get up. He can't walk. And sometimes what we need is forgiveness. You see, we assume... At least I had always assumed, maybe you hadn't, but I had always assumed that this really nice man suddenly became lame, crippled, where he was no longer able to walk. He had tried hard all of his life. He had worked hard all of his life. He was such a great father. He had wonderful kids. And, you know, whatever age you want to happen to make him, he was a, a, a really nice person. And then suddenly... Something has happened to him, a tragedy. And now he can't walk, and he's got these great friends who are going to bring him and allow him to be taken before Jesus so that he can be healed. That is not this story. This is a terrible, awful guy who has not been good to his family and not done good things. Aren't you assuming a little? Yes. Yes, I am. Jesus' first impression is, this is a sinful guy. So I want you to make this sinful guy just as bad as he can be. He is not nice to his family. He doesn't do anything good for anybody. anybody and he's got lots of anybody's enemies but there happens to be four guys who are willing to say, I think somebody can do something for him. Not that he deserves it, not that he should even get it. This is a horrible guy. But we're going to bring him to Jesus anyway, because even horrible people need to be brought to Jesus. And they see the situation and all the good people are crowded around Jesus and oh, he's so wonderful, he's doing... No, this is the guy who needs Jesus. This is a really bad guy outside and I don't know how much he's cussing the other people who are in his way, not letting him get through. After all, I'm the one that's lame. Why don't you get out of my way so I can get to Jesus? Yeah, I'm adding that. I understand. But this is a sinful guy. And they finally get him down in front of Jesus. Is he lame because he's sinful? Could be. You know, sometimes when we have had so much anger and so much frustration and so many terrible, awful things in our life, it can cause some physical issues. Sometimes what we need is forgiveness. But we won't say that. We'll say, well, you need more patience. We'll say you need more self-control. We'll say, well, you shouldn't be so selfish. We'll say, you know, you ought to love people more. That's not the issue. Should they do those things? Well, of course. Why don't they do those things? Because there's sin in their life. There's a reason why. This is a terrible person. And so they bring him before Jesus. And we want to define all the human traits and say, well, you know, just try harder. Let's blame everybody else. I think your parents didn't treat you right. And so that's the reason that you've had this. Or maybe you had things happen when you were younger. We can blame all kinds of other things and say, well, it's this, it's that. Your parents were on drugs. The one was an alcoholic. Somebody ran away and left you when you were young. And all of these other things. And it really comes down to one thing. Are we going to surrender our life so that somebody could heal us? And that's really what it comes down to. It takes repentance. Does the man repent? Well, I think at this point he's being carried on a stretcher by four guys. 
I take it it's willing that, you know, they didn't have to tie him on the stretcher to get him there to Jesus, but... And I, think, I find one thing just really incredible in this whole thing. Jesus says, well, your sins are forgiven. Everybody wants to argue with that. Well, who does he think he is to forgive sins? But no one says, this guy's not a sinner. Not a single person. Not Jesus. Not the crowd. Not the four guys. No one says... Oh, he's not a sinner. He just needs... No one's claiming that. This is a bad guy. He needs to be forgiven. He needs this. And Jesus is addressing the issue. It needs to have some surrender to let go of his ego, to let go of his control, to allow God to be in control somehow. The best way to heal a broken heart is to give God all the pieces. It's the only way it happens. You and I can't put it back together no matter how good a friend we are. There's only one person who's able to do that and we bring him to Jesus so he can heal. Only God forgives sins, that's true. Today we would say it's a need for counseling, not just repentance. They don't accept Jesus' authority to forgive sins is what seems to be happening. But he says one's proof of the other, right? One's proof of the other. If you can pick up your bed and walk, then you can go home. If your life straightens out after your repentance, would you say one's proof of the other? Maybe there's an issue there that is straightened out by that. I'm not saying anything bad about counseling because definitely it helps. But Jesus has authority to do things. And when we take his authority and we surrender to his authority and say, I will let you be Lord of my life. I will surrender everything to you. Even the disease I have, even the sin I have, everything to you. All Jesus has to do and say, pick up your bed and walk. Jesus is Savior. He saves the man from sin. He saves the man from his disease as well, from his paralysis. Jesus interprets what it looks like to be healed. Right? He interprets for this man what it looks like to be healed. See, people would come with all their issues, with all their problems, with all these great horrible things, and Jesus looks at him and he goes, you need your sins forgiven. And for so many people, it's like, well, no, no, I don't need that. Really? You know, that's really the simple answer to most of the things that go on in our life. If we'd surrender that, then a lot of things would fall into place. Do you know people who can do this? You see, some people take the wrong kind of view. They want to be accusing, you know, well, I think he's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins? You know, well, this isn't right. And oddly enough, as you go into most churches today, what you find is not a healed people. You find more the ones that want to accuse and say, I think he's blaspheming. You don't find people who have really surrendered their sin and said, you know what, we have been horrible, awful people, and we're not going to be that way anymore. And we want the healing that comes from God. Oddly enough, that's not what you find in the middle of church, in the middle of all of God's people. Why, Why not? not? If, if he's, he's the, the one, one that has authority, authority if, if he's, he's the, the one you come, come here, here to worship, worship why not? not? There, there ought, ought to be a way, way that we interpret, interpret for, for the rest of the world, world what this looks like. like. We, we are, are the, the explanation, explanation of the gospel. Of what, of what it means to be healed. Of what it means to be forgiven. Of what it means to be cleansed. And, and we've probably been in some situations where it's really difficult. What, what I, I want you to realize in both situations, situations both the king who had his dream, dream interpreted and the man who was healed, God is praised. 
And whenever, whenever you have that situation where God is praised, whatever it comes from, whether you're the interpreter of mysteries or whether you're just the guy who helped carry somebody else here to say, I want you to meet God. And then maybe you'll be healed. Maybe it's time for that. Maybe there's a place for that. Maybe it's a matter of just being able to say, yes, this is the place where I need to do that. And so sometimes we act more like Pharisees, concerned about the rules and what can take place and what can't take place and all of those things. We need to live out the attitudes. We need to live out Sermon on the Mount. We need to live out Gospel. We need to live out the healing process that this guy goes through and take any other story in there and say, how was this the interpretation for our world today? Well, we have a lot of mess in our world today. How do we explain the mystery of goodness? Because the world does not understand the mystery of goodness. How do we explain what it means to mourn? How do we explain that only the merciful get mercy? The ones who are not merciful get punished and then claim unfair, unfair. No, no it's what you wanted. It's what you chose. If you're, you're not, not going to be merciful, you don't get, get mercy. And, and people act shocked. Huh? It's, it's in here. here. And Jesus, Jesus comes not as a person to be pushed around, but a person who expects you to interpret the mystery and say, this is what life is about. We can explain the mystery of God. Maybe it's time for us to start first, however. Is, is there a time when people are going to praise God because of your life? Are they going to say, this is incredible, I can't believe what God is doing in your life? My question this morning is, what will it take for that to happen? Does it take repentance? Then you need to repent. Does it take you being involved in being that interpreter? The guy who carries the, the one corner... Then, then do that, whatever, whatever it takes for you to interpret, so that, that people praise God. So maybe, maybe it's time for you to come, for you to, you to respond. We, we come, come while we stand and sing. On I come, with a humble heart I come, bowing down before your holy throne, lifting holy hands to you, as I pledge my love anew, I worship you in spirit, I worship you in truth. Make my life a holy praise unto you. On bended knee I come, with a broken heart I come, bowing down. Before your holy throne, as I look upon your face, show your mercy and your grace, change my life, O oh Holy Spirit, make me fresh and